So, today we're going to talk about contemporary architectures. This means the kinds of architectures that you might actually be using today, such as on your PC or on your mobile device. This is part of the third section of the module. We've covered all the relevant theory in the previous two. Now we're in this process of looking at how that theory gets applied in particular kinds of architectures that you might actually encounter out in the wild. So last, last week we looked at small embedded architectures because they're nice and small and easy to understand like Arduino. This week we're going to look at contemporary architecture. Next time we'll start looking at, at bigger, somewhat more futuristic systems, ideas around parallel computing, um, and in the final lecture we'll take a look into the more distant future of architecture. Um, so this, this is a relevant lecture if, if you're aiming to be a user of contemporary architectures, if you're planning to program on a PC, for example, um, which hopefully most of you are. Um, in particular, it's relevant if you're thinking about what to buy or what to build. So some of you may have built your own PCs. Um, when you take your first graduate job, it is traditional for your employer to give you a budget and say, go and buy yourself a computer. And if that's the very first thing you do on your first day, it's a nice way of showing off how much computer science you actually know if you can make a decent job of, of understanding what you're actually buying and buying something suitable. Um, that gets a little bit more interesting if they later put you in charge of a 10 million pound data center and you're gonna decide what architectures to buy um, to stock up your data center. So typically that means look, looking at an advert, something like this. Okay, this is for, for a Dell laptop. It tells you something about the CPU, something about the memory, um, something about the sec secondary storage. Uh, what, what do these numbers actually mean? Yeah, ho hopefully you're, you're not just going to take this at face value. You're going to go and look up the data sheets for these products and find out what it is you're actually buying inside. Um, so in, in many cases, that CPU is going to be a member of a family called x86. These are the CPUs that are made by the company Intel and AMD and occasionally by some others. Um, these are examples of CISC architectures, which we'll talk about in the first half of the lecture. Uh, in the second half of the lecture, we will talk about RISC architectures. The, these are architectures that tend to show up more on mobile devices. And we look at a particular flavor of risk called risk five. Um, and if, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about some, some real world issues about how architecture hooks into your operating system um, to actually make your, your computer go. So we'll, we'll start by, by discussing this concept of performance. Okay, performance means how, how do you know what a computer can do? If you're going to buy a computer, how do you measure how well it's going? Um, how do you compare different computers against each other? Or if you're designing the computer, how do you measure how well your design is going so that you can figure out what to optimize next? Now, for, for a long time, um, until re really just a few years ago, there, there was an obvious way of doing this, and it was just looking at your computer's clock speed. Um, so du during the 1990s in particular, that was the era of these beige box PCs where Moore's Law was ticking away nicely. Um, clock, clock speed would just get faster and faster every year, and it was fairly clear you could measure your computer against your friend or enemy's computer um, by saying who had the faster clock. And so people would talk about how many megahertz their clock ran at, or hun hundreds of megahertz, and then how many gigahertz. Um, so round about here, <coughs> in the early 2000s, that all ground to a halt, and the clock speed basically flattened off around about 3.5 gigahertz. Um, this is due to fundamental limitations of physics. You could make clocks go faster than that, but according to fundamental physics, your CPU would get more and more hot. Okay, more, more and more energy would be used to go at those speeds. That energy would come out as heat. Um, and you'd end up with CPUs. You, you can already just about fry an egg on a modern CPU, but if this had have continued, things would have got hotter and hotter up to the, the temperatures of uh, rocket exhausts and the, the surface of the sun. 
So this, this all had to stop for these very fundamental reasons. Um, what has happened instead over the, the last two decades is that the number of transistors we can fit on a piece of silicon has continued to increase. Um, that is sometimes quoted as Moore's law. Other people used to quote clock speed um, as a form of Moore's law. And they, they used to move together, and you can see they, they diverged around there. Um, ev even back then, measuring CPUs according to their clock speed was not ideal. It's, it's quite a crude metric. For example, it, it doesn't include how many instructions get executed per cycle. Okay, that's to do with pipelining or out-of-order execution. It doesn't include... Um, how complex are the instructions? So in a CISC instruction set, one instruction does a lot of work, right? In a RISC instruction set, you might have four instructions that together do the work of one CISC instruction. Um, you can consider the word length. So an instruction that only operates on eight bits is doing less work than an instruction that operates on 64 bits. Um, and it doesn't hit on en any of the delays from the rest of the computer design outside the CPU. That includes all the timing issues we've seen in caches, um, out in RAM, um, and e even out in I.O. So clock speed is a, a crude measure. And it's, it's quite possible that the bottleneck in your computer system could be somewhere else in the computer design. Um, this is the CPU performance equation. This this shows us how to break down some metric of performance into three sub factors. Um, so the, the total CPU time, this, this is how long a given CPU takes to execute your program. Um, if we ignore everything outside the CPU, like the, the IO and the, the operating system and so on. But we, we can break down what the CPU is doing itself into these three factors. We, we can say, how long does it take to run one cycle? So that's where the clock speed enters the equation. Um, but you've then got to consider how many cycles are required per instruction and how many instructions are required to do your task. Um, so this, this is a job for, for fundamental physics. How fast can you clock your CPU? It has pretty much maxed out at 3.5 gigahertz. When we talk about how many cycles per instruction, um, there, there is still work being done, or work, work to be done here. So this, this is about how complex are your instructions, how much work is done by each instruction, how many distinct sub-cycles or clock ticks are, are required um, to carry out an instruction. And then if, if you look at ideas like pipelining and other forms of parallelism, um, such as out-of-order execution, and later in the module we'll talk about um, how GPUs take that parallelism to, to very extreme sizes. Um, so there's still, still a lot of architectural work being done around here. And then the, the third factor is more at the, at the user end. This is about algorithmic complexity. So as a, as a programmer, are you actually writing your program in the most efficient way? Could you write your program so that it inherently requires fewer instructions to accomplish the same task? Um, nowadays, that's not just the end user programmer, it's also the compiler writer. Remember, compiler writers are the major consumers of computer architecture now, and they form the interface between the end user programmer um, and the underlying architecture. You will sometimes see instructions per second quoted as a measure of performance, uh, especially MIPS, that's mi millions of instructions per second. Um, these are all nice little mathematical equations. Uh, they're, they're very easy to examine um, and, and are included um, in part for that reason. How many instructions per second can you execute? Well, nowadays it depends how many sockets you have because you, you may have more than one CPU um, and each CPU may have multiple cores and then what's the clock speed of each core and then how many instructions per cycle um, is that core running on. Again, you can compare two computers by MIPS and have a not very meaningful comparison because one computer might have instructions that are complex CISC instructions 
and are doing a lot of work. So in a CISC architecture, you might, for example, have a single instruction that performs a, a Fourier transform on a piece of data. That's, that's the kind of thing you do in signal processing applications. And that, that single instruction could be doing the work potentially of te tens or even hundreds of risk instructions that are just performing basic loading and storing and arithmetic. Um, if you're interested in scientific computing, so a, a major application of performance metrics is to do with designing supercomputers, data centers, um, you know, the big computers that we run here in a university um, for simulating the physical world. If you're doing this kind of scientific style computing, it's more meaningful to talk about how many floating point operations can you do per second. So this, to some extent, this gets you away from the MIPS problem um, by specifying we're only interested in a particular type of instructions. And these are basic arithmetic instructions running on floating point, because that's what most scientific computation <coughs> tends to spend its time doing. Um, so you can create a similar equation to the MIPS one, but by only considering the floating point instructions. So you'll, you'll often see flops, floating point operations per second used to tell you how, how brilliant the new university supercomputer is, um, especially when someone's trying to sell it to you. But don't just think about the CPU. You know, there, there was a time when people went to buy a new PC and they just looked at the clock speed and that gave you a rough idea how good the computer as a whole was. It's still, still common for people to buy PCs based on the CPU. You probably don't look so much at the speed now because it's probably still about 3.5 gigahertz. Um, but you might look at the, the version number and the, the year and the cost. Often the cost is a proxy for how good the thing actually is. Um, but it, it can be the case that the CPU is no longer the bottleneck. So when we discussed pipelining, we saw pipelines can be held up by hazards. Yeah, if, there, if there's a problem accessing your memory, for example, if you've hit on the cache and the data you're looking for is not in the cache, it's going to take you time to go and pull that data out of main memory, and that's going to create hazards in your CPU. Your CPU is going to have to sit around waiting for that data to come in. Um, so now, nowadays, it's quite common for the cache to be the, the bottleneck. Your memory has a certain speed. Hopefully, you're not hitting on main memory most of the time. Hopefully, you're hitting on cache memory. And so the speed of that cache has become very important. And the size of the cache, which determines how often you actually get to make use of it. Um, I.O. may be the bottleneck if you're a data scientist, for example, and your job involves chugging through many terabytes of data every day. That is fundamentally hitting on secondary storage rather than main memory. And so in those applications, you've got to go and optimize that part of the system instead of the CPU or the memory or the cache. Um, and if you're, if you're working in a field like robotics, which has lots of I.O. and lots of strange physical devices, um, you, you may get interested in the buses, the speed that data can actually run between these devices. Um, this can also affect your I.O. performance, normal I.O., so your, your hard disk. You could have the fastest hard disk in the world, but if your bus is really slow, there's no point because you've got to wait for the bus. So it's important to identify which is the weakest point of your system because that's the bottleneck, and that will set the speed for everything else. Um, one metric that is, is often used is known as Am Amdahl's Law, after uh, Jean Amdahl, who was at IBM, I think. Um, and Am Amdahl's Law, it, it's to do with what speed up do you get if you replace one component of your system with something faster. And in, in many cases, that's done through parallelization. You might have a CPU, and you replace it with four CPUs. Okay? You're, you're going to parallelize that part of the system. Um, and, and the point is you can, you can make a very large improvement. You could make this one part of your system go 100 times faster, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your system as a whole is going to run 100 times faster because at some point you're going to run into the bottleneck that is caused by some other part of the system, such as the bus or the memory or, or the, the hard disk. So um, Amdahl's law gives you a way to convert your speed increase for a single component into a speed increase of the whole system. 
So look, here we have, here we have a, a system, part of the system F we are going to speed up. So th this might be the CPU. We're going to replace it with a system that goes n times faster. Um, so here n is about four, because you can see the blue bar is now about a quarter as long as it used to be. But the other part of the system is still running at the same speed, one, one minus f. Now f, f is the fraction of system speed. Um, so when, when you do the workshops, we'll give you some examples of this. Um, again, nice, nice topic to examine because it's a very numerate, um, quantitative kind of question. Um, you can plug these numbers in to Amdahl's law and you will you'll figure out the total speed up. And so, for example, if you're considering spending £5,000 on this fancy new CPU, you would like to say, is this actually going to speed up my system? Okay, the new, the new CPU might give you four times as many cores as your old one. But if everything else in the system is dragging you down, maybe that's not the best use of your £5,000 and you should go and spend it pro probably on something less glamorous sounding, right? Like speeding up your cash or speeding up your bus. But of, often the bottleneck now can be moved um, into those other places. It has become increasingly important for humanity to think about energy usage and sustainability. And sustainability metrics are now appearing on all kinds of consumer uh, and industrial devices um, as a factor in your, your purchasing, including on your computers. So this is it's an issue on a small device like your phone not not so much in terms of saving the planet but more in terms of the usability of your phone you know, if your if your phone is burning through energy fast that means the battery will run out and you don't have a very long lifespan in your pocket and as a, a user that's going to affect you on, on on the other side of the 2020s view of architecture is big cloud computing data center type architectures and this this is where energy consumption really can affect the state of the planet so it's, a, it's interesting to see the scale of these devices okay a, a, a typical human sized machine like a washing machine or a lawnmower uses about a kilowatt of power okay that's that's a nice unit on which to base your view of everything else um, Roughly what a, a horse can produce, we used to have a unit called the horsepower that was roughly of that size. Uh, it's roughly the kind of power that many of our agricultural robots here in Lincoln consume, um, which are basically replacing the work of horses um, out in the fields. So if you, if you take a kilowatt as your basic unit, you can say which, which things are smaller than a kilowatt, which things are larger than a kilowatt. You can see your, your desktop PC is, is may, maybe around the tenth of that. Okay, so t turning off your PC is not as important as turning off your washing machine. Yeah, Wa washing machines are an interesting part of domestic sustainability. Um, but your, your PC is consuming more than a light bulb or your router, or may maybe you have a little Raspberry Pi as a, a home server. So it's le less important to go around turning off these devices than, than to sh shut down your, your PC. And your, your TV or monitor is probably consuming something pretty similar. Um, when you get to transport, physically moving stuff around tends to use massively more energy than just moving information around. Okay, so when, when, when you get to a car, you can see this is 100 times larger than your washing machine. Your, your car is a very important source of energy usage. Um, Flying is a couple of orders of magnitude larger than driving, right? We've gone from 100 kilowatts to 70 megawatts. So reducing your flying can be very important. Um, usually much more important than running around your house turning all the LED lights off because they're so small, they, they can be quite negligible compared with your one flight per year. Um, and look, a, a, a typical data center is somewhere in between a car and a flight. Okay, um, that's that's not a internet-sized data center. That, that that's the typical single company data center. 
Um, so a data center for a search engine or a social network could be 10, even 100 times larger than that. So you, you often see in the news com companies are trying to get publicity by showing off how green they've become and they'll talk about their green data centers. You know, maybe you go and locate your data center in a cold country to save on cooling systems. Um, and so in, instead of cooling internally, you just put all your heat out and it can go away and melt the ice in whatever country you happen to be in. Um, but just, just con consider what this actually means, okay? Your, your data center here, this is about 3,000 times the power of a car. This, this has actually gone up, okay? When, when I started teaching this course, the data center was more, more down here, but they've been growing in size over time. Um, so, you know, if you, if you turn your data center off, that's, <coughs> that's like taking 3,000 cars off the road, yeah? So you, you might consider, for example, if, if your company has 30,000 employees, is it better to have them all work remotely and not have to drive their cars to work every day? Or is it, is it better to turn your data center off? Um, you know, should, should these people be driving to the data center or could they be remoting into the data center? Our power comes from power stations like Drax. So Dra Drax is a four gigawatt source of energy. That, that gives you some idea of what, what portion of that is required to power one data center. Um, of course, we, we have to pay for this energy usage nowadays. Nowadays, it's quite a lot. Everyone is struggling um, to pay for energy. T typically, we pay for energy in what is called units. That's a kilowatt hour. That's the same unit you buy your domestic um, electricity in. Um, price fl fluctuates around um, normally ten tens of cents or, or pennies um, per unit. So in addition to these traditional metrics like MIPS and FLOPS, you will you'll nowadays see metrics including prices and what's, you know, what, what's the actual cost of building this data center in terms of the running cost. You know, how, how, many, how many FLOPS per watt is your scientific supercomputer going to provide? Or how many flops per dollar of energy consumption is it going to provide? Um, in practice, when you buy computers, it's common to use standard benchmarks. A, a benchmark is just some standardized task. You're going to run it on the computer and you're going to see how long it takes. Um, and some, some of these have become well established and well respected and if everybody knows what they mean and that they're a fair comparison between different systems. Um, so some, some benchmark tasks are designed specifically to test certain computational features. So for example, Whetstone. Whetstone is a special program. It has been written just for the purpose of testing the computer's performance. It doesn't do anything inherently useful, but it will, it will run through a whole bunch of mostly scientific calculations that are typical of many scientific use cases, and it will tell you how long it took to, to chug through them. Um, if you're doing certain types of scientific application, use a lot of linear algebra. This means computing with matrices and vectors. Um, that, that's often hitting on particular types of architecture, and if your workload is going to look like that, you can use a different benchmark called LINPAC that is focused um, just on doing linear algebra. Um, or if you're doing computation that isn't so scientific um, and you're, you're less interested in these floating point type calculations, there's a dry stone is a play on words of wet stone. Um, this is designed to give you more, more of a measure of, kind of general consumer type computer usage. Um, or if you want to measure actual real world tasks, you can go to the Ferronix suite. Uh, and Ferronix will, it will run through a whole bunch of actual applications. So rather than being synthetic tasks, it will actually run some games, some office applications, some multimedia stuff. Um, the, the same apps that will actually be used in real life on, on a typical consumer machine um, and give you some measure of that. So when you measure anything with metrics or, or benchmarks, 
these numbers can be gamed. Okay? It's, it's a major problem in the modern world that we try to measure everything, and as soon as we do that, people figure out a way to game the metrics. So you know, th this happens in everything from vehicle emissions tests to university rankings. As, as soon as people figure out what's being measured, they just go and optimize that thing at the expense of everything else. So there's always a bit of a cat and mouse game going on. There, there have been cases, for example, where architects have built in dedicated digital logic that detects whether a user is running one of these standard benchmark tasks, right? And if it, if it spots you're running the benchmark, it's just got a whole load of pre-cached correct answers stored in ROM on the CPU that it can just spit out in order one time. You know, this, this is the same idea that was found in the vehicle emissions scandal. Yeah? They, they built in special systems that detect if you're running an emissions test and then it's going to change the, the behavior as it goes. So there's, there's always a bit of game. Um, I mean, some, some compilers even have flags now. This has become so institutionalized, you can compile your code and say, please use the built-in benchmark cheating functions, or please don't use them as a, as a flag in the GCC compiler. Um, so be, be aware of the, the quality of your benchmark and the reputation of it, and to, to what extent can it, it be gained. So this, this is often known as Goodhart's Law. Okay, Good, Goodhart's Law says when a measure becomes a target, uh, it ceases to become a good measure, and it is a scourge of the modern world. Okay, so that, that gives you some idea of th things to look for when, when you're buying a PC. Pro probably if you're buying a desktop PC, it will be a CISC, probably an x86 Intel AMD architecture. Um, Probably if you're buying a mobile device, it will be a, a risk architecture. Maybe that is, is changing a bit more now. But this x86 architecture has been dominant for a, a very long time. It reached its 40th birthday in 2018, right? which is ancient in terms of modern computing. Um, so x86, it refers to a, a, a series of chip designs. They, they used to have names like X086, 80, um, HE86, 80286, then there was the 386 and the 486. These are the early 90s machines. They, they all ended in 86, and so the series as a whole has become known as X86, where the X is a placeholder that stands for any of them. Um, this has gone on through three generations of designs. Um, early ones were 16-bit. In the 1990s, we were 32-bit. By the 2000s, um, up to 64-bit. And what, what characterizes them as a, a unified architectural family is that they are all back compatible with one another. That means you can, you can take your program in machine code written 40 years ago on one of these tiny 16-bit systems and you can run the same machine code on your modern 64-bit Intel core without having to change anything at the programmer level. Um, so this, this style of architecture has a very commercial focus. In commercial applications, it's often very important to have that back compatibility. If your customers bought a load of stuff even 40 years ago, you don't want to break it, and so you deliberately build in extra architectural features to ensure that back compatibility is there. At the same time, x86, it's a CISC architecture, that means it is a complex instruction set. Um, that means individual instructions can be complex. It also means this set as a whole can be complex, as in having many instructions which all do very specialized things. And so through this evolution, more and more instructions have been added to the instruction set. And you know, there's, there's now over 3,000 instructions, which is well, well beyond the ability of a human assembler programmer um, to, to use in a meaningful way. So we're completely reliant on compilers um, for using most of these instructions. So it, it's worth studying a little bit of the history of x86 to understand why it is the way it is. Because when you see it, there are lots of things about it that seem very strange and which would never be designed like that if you were starting from scratch. 
The point of x86 is that it has evolved over a particular history and they've always tried to keep this back compatibility and that, that's why it is the way it is. Um, it goes all the way back to 1956. Um, you remember Wil William Shockley, invented, inventor of the transistor, yeah, back from the history lecture? Um, in 1956, Shockley was awarded the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor. Um, and as, as is always the case, when you win the Nobel Prize, you can do whatever you like. Okay? You, you have the rest of your life, no worries about money. Um, you're famous, you can go anywhere, you can do anything. Um, and so Shock Shockley decided to take that ability to move back to his mum. And his mum lived in Palo Alto, California, which at the time was a sleepy uh, agricultural part of um, the west coast of America with very little going on apart from agriculture. Um, and he just wanted to live where his mum was living, down the road. So he went there and he rented a little building um, this is from the same, same kind of area when they started Pizza Hut. If you've ever, ever seen old photographs of the founding of Pizza Hut, similar kind of setup. Yeah, rented this little building, started a company called Shockley Transistor, uh, and started making transistors based on his Nobel Prize winning research. Um, and he hired a bunch of people, including one Gordon Moore of Moore's Law and Robert Noyce. Um, and this, this was the 1950s, right? At, at, at this time, company culture was that you graduated, you got a job, and you stayed at that job for the rest of your life until you retired. And then you, you get a gold watch and a retirement home. And it was ab absolutely unheard of for a company person to quit their job and move to a rival company, um, let, let, let alone start their own rival company. Um, un, until... 1957, um, when Moore and Noyce were part of a group known as the Treach Treacherous Eight, and they, they were the first people to do this. They, they fell out with Shockley. Another thing that happens when you win a Nobel Prize is you can go a bit crazy, and uh, what's the word? Meg megalomania. Um, it's quite, quite, quite a well-known issue with Nobel laureates. Um, this bunch of eight staff had, uh, had, had some personality differences with Shockley. And for, for the, the first time in American corporate history, they left the company. They all came out together and they moved down the road and they founded a rival company which they called Fairchild Semiconductor. So at, at the time, this was, this was considered disloyal, unethical. Yeah, you, you'd probably never get a job anywhere else again if people had heard of you doing this in your career history. But this, this became the pattern for everything that happened in Silicon Valley since. You know, now, nowadays, we assume you're going to go and work for big tech for two years and meet a bunch of people and then walk out and do it all by yourselves um, in another little startup office down the road, which you probably then sell back to the big tech company another two years later for a ton of money. Um, so it was Fair, Fairchild who actually took this forward. They, they commercialised the integrated circuit, aka the chip. Um, and this became a, a, a big thing, still, still in this area of California, um, largely just because of one customer, the US government. So S Silicon Valley today likes to go on about how entrepreneurial it is and how much it loves the free market. Um, and capitalism and all of that, but it was all built on selling stuff to the government for pu public, specifically military usage. Um, and this, this got so big and the, the lid had been taken off the, the genie bottle of corporate culture, it, it got so big that everyone started pulling the same trick. So many employees of Fairchild left to start their own competing startups down the road. And so Cal California started to fill with little sheds like this with people making semiconductors in them. Um, that, that included Moore and Noyce. They quit their own 
company, Fairchild, and started another one um, called Integrated Electronics, um, or Intel, in 1968. Um, and the, the, the following year, Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD, was set up um, specifically to clone Intel products. Okay? That, that's the founding mission of AMD, is to just make whatever Intel makes and to compete against them. So by, by the time we get to 1971, we see the, the Intel 4004. That's a four-bit chip. Um, not much use for big computation, more for use in little gadgets like calculators. Um, but pa paving the way for the 8080, um, the first eight-bit chip. And shortly afterwards, the first 16-bit chip, the 8086. And this, this is the chip that is the start of that family which is all defined by the, the back compatibility. So it's interesting, the, the, the 86 number survived. Yeah, it, it became the 186, the 286, the 486. Um, the 80, the 80 also survived. This design forked. The, the 80 became the Z80. That's the chip that's found in the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. So you, you can see this, this is the ancestor. Um, of a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and something important happened in 1982 um, from a, a business perspective. So here, here you've got IBM doing computer design, build, building whole computers. And I, IBM figured out they could be held to ransom if they only had one supplier of CPUs. If you build your whole computer based on someone else's product, on an Intel CPU, um, that company could then ratchet up the price and you just have to pay it because your whole computer design depends on their architecture. Um, this, this is a general issue in both hardware and software engineering. Okay? If your design depends entirely on someone else's thing, they now have all the power and that they can put up their prices. And so I, IBM created this, this very famous and still existing agreement between Intel and AMD. I, I, IBM said, we, we'd love to buy your chips, Intel, um, but we're not going to as long as you're the only person who makes them. And so we will give you this huge multi-million dollar contract for chips only on the condition that you let AMD clone all your products and act as a second source to us. Um, and so in, Intel goes and thinks about it. You know, we're, we're going to lose some profit because AMD are going to compete against us. But on the other hand, both us and then AMD get half of the multi-million dollar deal and we're both going to get zero otherwise. So a very clever bit of company strategy and, and game theory on the part of IBM here. And that, that's created the situation we still have today where these two companies are allowed to make effectively the same, not exactly the same product, but they, they, they can make implementations of the, the same architecture um, without necessarily getting into to legal trouble. So this this then set the pace for, for the next decade or so. You, you now see Intel and AMD are going to compete. They're both going to make versions of the same chips and they're going to go from 16 bits up to 32 bits. And so all, all through the 1990s there was this, um, this game of them trying to leapfrog over each other. Sometimes Intel's in the lead, sometimes AMD's in the lead. Tr traditionally Intel was the innovator and AMD was created specifically to copy what Intel had done. Um, but then you, you start to see AMD creating its own innovations um, and some, sometimes Intel um, racing to catch up with them. There, there was a short, short period in the 90s where other companies came in as well. Uh, Citrix and Via started making the same x86 architecture, um, always with in, interesting uh, legal challenges in the background. By the time they got to the 586, in, Intel realized that you can't, um, you can't copyright a number. You can copyright names of chips, but you can't copyright numbers. So if you make a 486, AMD can call their thing 486 as well. 
but by, by the time they got to the 586, they renamed it as the Pentium. Okay, pen, pent meaning five, um, so that it could be trademarked, I think, rather than copyrighted. Um, so you can see some of the other vendors had to carry on using the number five, 586 and 686, when Intel had moved to Pentium. Um, by, by the time you get to around 2000, that's when we hit the, the one gigahertz um, clock speed. So fo following the 32-bit era was the 64-bit era, which is where, where we are still. Um, what you find in 64-bit x86 is a divergence of the names of things from the actual underlying architectures. In the 32-bit age, it was common for the things sold to consumers to describe what was actually in the chip. So if you were sold a Pentium chip, you'd know that was actually the Pentium architecture. In the 64-bit age, the marketing people have gone off and done their own thing, and so what you see on the box doesn't really tell you as much about what's inside anymore. So it's become much more important when you buy a computer based on one of these chips to actually look at the details and get the data sheet and find out what's really inside. Um, so in, in, in particular, the, the chips you buy now in this series, they probably have names like Core, i3, i5, i7, i9, or Pentium, or Xeon. And these, these names are almost completely meaningless, okay? They, they just roughly mean cheap, normal, and expensive. And that's, that's all these names tell you. What, what you need to do is get the data sheet and find out what is the actual architecture um, underlying the product. And these have names like Sandy Bridge and Haswell and Coffee Lake and Ice Lake. Um, that will tell you the actual digital logic design um, that is implementing the instruction set. Um, of, of note is that AMD took the lead in the 64-bit era. So you, you may have noticed some confusion between the name x86 and AMD 64. Okay, for you. Do you, do you have any Linux Linux users in here? Yeah, when, when, when you install your package files and you say, you know, do you want the RISC version or do you want the AMD64 version? Um, Linux, especially Debian, is very focused on naming things correctly. And so they'll, they'll often insist on using the name AMD64 rather than x86. Um, and the reason for that is that the 64-bit version of this instruction set was not created by Intel, it was created by AMD. They, they took the lead and they got their definition out first, which Intel then had to copy. And a, a, AMD were perfectly within their rights to name their invention whatever they wanted and they chose to call it AMD 64. Um, whereas in, Intel have to call it x86-64. But te technically the thing should be called AMD 64 because um, they came first. If you ever work with either of these companies, you've got to use their own name for these things, um, otherwise they get very annoyed. So you, you can see during the 2010s, we've seen in increasing specialization and the, the addition of many new features and instructions. Up to about this point, the clock speeds were still getting faster, right? right around about early 2000s, we just hit this three gigahertz mark and ne never really went anywhere else and so all the innovations after that have been about adding in new features doing extra stuff with the verb circuit so for example you you now get these very fancy branch predictors yeah we, we talked about can you try and guess in advance which way a branch is going to go are you going to do the jump or are you not going to do the jump so for example a amd um for, for 10 years now, AMD have been building neural nets into the architectural logic to try and guess which way these uh, branches are going to go. Um, you'll see lo lots of extra instructions getting inserted for things like virtualization, cryptography, um, vector calculations, um, and then increasing the number of cores. We got dual core in 2007. 32 cores in 2017, uh, 64 um, or more um, becoming realistic now. So you can see x86, it has this complicated history, and that history is important because it defines the way the architecture is today. Um, this is the original register set, for example. Okay, the, 
original x86 just had eight registers, and like, like many computers of the time, they, the main ones were called A, B, C, and D. And then it's got some extra ones for the stack, um, some extra ones for indexing address modes. But you know, early x86 programs would load stuff into register A, it would load something else into B, it would add them together and put the result in C. Um, all, all very straightforward. So what, what you see today, th this is a modern x86 register set. You can see those, those original registers still exist, okay? Here's, here's register A, B, C, and D. Those, those are the original um, user-facing registers. Um, you'll see the, the stack pointer and all that as well, sitting down here. But you, it's been expanded. If every generation of x86 has it's kept the original compatibility, but it's expanded it. So we went from 8 bits to 16 bits to 32, um, up to 64. And so when, when you see these expansions, they're, they're given extra letters. So E originally stood for expansion, and then we did it again, and we went to R. R is the 64-bit version. But you can still write programs that address just 8 bits or 16 bits, or all the way up to 64 bits out of that same register. Um, then we got expansions. We'll talk more about parallel computing next time, but a, a lot of these registers are for representing vector quantities. They're not just single numbers, but they might be 3D coordinates for your video game, um, or 4, 4D color coordinates, of RGB alpha um, channels. And so th these were originally called multimedia registers, or MM. Uh, they were known as M MMX extensions. Now, now they have names like uh, a AVR for uh, advanced vector registers, I think. But again, they've, they've been extended. They've grown and grown, and some, some of these are larger than the, the word length. So now, now you have registers that are 128-bit or even up to 512 uh, in, in the latest extensions. So you, you can see it's, it's evolved and it's grown over time, but it's always kept the core of where it came from. This is what programming in x86 tends to look like. Um, again, because of its history, there isn't just one style of x86 programming. There, there are several different assemblers. Remember, assembly language is a human-readable form of the machine code. And an assembler converts your human notation into the actual zeros and ones. So un unlike most architectures, x86 has developed different conventions for doing this. Um, this example uses a particular assembler called NASM, um, which I per personally prefer. So you, you can see it's, it's similar to all the other assembly languages we've seen. Okay, this, this is a move, but we're placing the number, the constant 123, into register RBX. And remember, when you put R on the front of a register, that means we're talking about the 64-bit version of it. Whereas here we're placing a hex number into an E register. That's just using the first 32 bits of the same register. Um, or, or you can go right back to these little tiny 8-bit registers from the old days and put in individual zeros and ones into the same register. Um, here we're doing a copy. So same, same instruction move, copying between registers. Um, here's, here's some different versions showing di different addressing modes. Um, here's some indirect addressing, some offset addressing. Um, so un unlike many architectures, in x86, you've always got to think about which word length are you using. Because that history is there, you've got to decide, are we talking about a byte? Are we talking about a word? Are we talking about a, a double word? So again, the, this term word is unfortunate, because word is supposed to mean the natural length of your current CPU. But they, they built in the concept of Word in the 16-bit era, and it still stuck around. And so then in the 32-bit age, they had to go to this thing called a double word to mean four bytes. And now we have quad words um, to mean eight bytes. So again, you, you wouldn't design a modern architecture in these terms. It's because of the way it's evolved over time. Um, so here's, here's some arithmetic. Okay, here's... Here's some addition. Um, 
notice addition and multiplication are done in different ways. Okay, in addition, you f you move your first value into a register, and then you use that same register as an accumulator. So when you do add, it's adding to into that existing register. Now that, that's a very old piece of x86 architecture in history. And multiplication was added later in the evolution. Um, and because of the way it was implemented, it doesn't have the same structure. So for multiplication, look, you load your two, um, two values into two different registers first, A and B. You load those in, and then you just call multiply. And this, this instruction assumes that the other value is in register A, and it assumes it's going to store the result in register A. So again, this is a very particular way of implementing multiplication that has evolved over time. Um, here's an example of doing a jump. Look, we've given a label. We've said compare. Are these two numbers equal? If they're, um, if they are equal, we're going to do jump. If equal, we're going to jump back to the label. Now, if you want to play around with this stuff, and of, over the Christmas break is a good time to play around with assembly coding. Um, if you have an x86-based machine available. It's much easier to use this than all the other assembly languages we've seen because you can run it on the actual computer that you're writing the program on. Um, so if you download the NASAM assembler, you, you can write your program like this. You put it in a file called .s. You can just paste off this slide, if you like, paste these instructions into a file, run NASAM on it, tell it what you want to generate. In this case, it's a 64-bit executable. Um, link it and run it and that that will run directly on your own computer so this this is different from all the other assemblers we've seen because all the other systems we've had to simulate a different cpu you know in in mari you're running a purely fictional simulated cpu or if you use an arduino simulator you're using a simulated arduino but in this case you can actually run on the physical cpu that you're doing the development work on as well so it's much easier to do